heard about PCR biosystems? There's quite a buzz about us. Pop on over to our website to find out more. and welcome to Pint of Science. We are the bath version of Pint of Science and today our show is about the sun, skin and science. Um, so we all know what skin is, we all have skin. Skin is the largest organ of the body and it's essential for survival. It provides protection from UV radiation in sunlight and constantly repairs itself to protect from everyday damage. But what happens when this process goes wrong? And if the skin is so great, how come we have to wear sun cream? In this show, we'll share the research of two experts who'll explore everything you ever wanted to know about the science of sun and your skin. So hopefully you're all ready and settled in for a wonderful evening of science. Um, pop in the comments where you're coming from and we'll have a little look. Um, if you have any questions for our speakers whilst they're giving their talks, please also pop them in the comments. Um, and without much further ado, Let's go to our very first speaker, who is Dr. Gernot Walko from the Department of Biology and Biochemistry at the University of Bath. And he's going to be talking to us today about how is skin cancer related to sun exposure? So Gernot, take it away. All right. A very good evening, everyone, wherever you are in the world, in front of your screens and the warm hello from the beautiful city of Bath here in the West Countries of the United Kingdom. My name is Gernot Walk. I'm Assistant Professor in Cell Biology at the University of Bath and this is my great pleasure to talk to you today about the connection between skin cancer and sun exposure. Now in my research group here at the University of Bath we are passionate about skin and we like to think that this is indeed the most fascinating organ. In fact, skin is the largest organ of the human body. For the um, average adult human individual, the skin has a surface area of between 1.5 and 2 square meters, which equates to about 16 to 22 square feet. So quite a large organ indeed. And skin is not only the largest organ of the human body, but it also has many important functions. For example, specialized structures called sweat glands, you can see one here in this illustration, enable us to regulate our body temperature. And this ability to control the temperature of our body through sweating has enabled our species to adopt to living in various climate zones. And moreover, the ability to sweat has endowed us with a truly remarkable endurance for exercise. Our skin also contains the so-called hair follicles, which you can see here, which continuously produce new hairs. And as you can see over here, these yellow structures, these are nerve endings that wrap around the base of the hair follicles. And this enables us to feel the movement of the air if we blow over our skin like this. And in addition, there are various so-called mechanoreceptors in our skin. You can see them here, here, and here in this illustration. And these mechanoreceptors, they enable us to feel touch. On average, a square inch of our skin contains about 1,000 nerve endings that are attached to these mechanoreceptors. And this number is much higher, for example, in the skin of our lips. And this is essentially why kissing feels so good. And if we take a look across the animal kingdom, we find that skin is able to give rise to a remarkable diversity of very different structures, which include, for example, nails, feathers, beaks, and also scales. Now, the outermost tissue layer of the skin, 
which is what we can see by eye and which is shown here in this illustration as a cross section is called the epidermis. Now, the epidermis serves as an essential barrier against our environment by preventing potentially disease-causing microorganisms such as bacteria, which I've indicated here, and fungi, as well as toxic chemicals from entering into our skin and thus entering into our body. And so consequently, the epidermis is really, really important for our health and thus this vital tissue must therefore be constantly renewed throughout our lives. And this truly remarkable feat is mediated by very special cells, which we call stem cells. So what are stem cells and what makes these cells so special? Well, the human body is composed of about 30 trillion cells and we need to make new cells all the time just to keep our body functioning. But some specialized cells, such as, for example, blood and muscle cells, or in, a, in our case here, the cells that make up the protective barrier structure of the epidermis, are unable to make copies of themselves through a, a process called cell division. And so instead, such cell types rely on populations of stem cells to be replenished. So how does this work? Well, as I've indicated here, stem cells, so the, the, the violet cell here, they have the unique ability to produce both copies of themselves, the pink daughter cells here. This is a process that we call self-renewal and also other more specialized cell types through a process called terminal differentiation every time these cells divide. And these two processes, self-renewal and terminal differentiation, they continue throughout the life of the organism that is our lives. Now, I know this is very complicated, so to illustrate this better, I am now going to show you a little animation. So here we're now zooming in to the deep layers of the epidermis because this is where the stem cells are located and you can see one here in violet, which is now undergoing cell division whereby it generates two pink stem cell daughters. And one of the two stem cell daughters yeah, then divides again. This is happening now, but now you can see that one of the daughters of this stem cell is developing into one of the specialized cells that make up the protective barrier structure of our epidermis. So I know we all love a nice day outside to get some sunshine and feeling the warmth of the sun beating down on us like on our students here at the university campus. But I will tell you now who doesn't, the stem cells in your epidermis. And it is an unfortunate truth that cancers that originate from the stem cells in our epidermis have become by far the most frequently diagnosed cancers in the UK and worldwide. About 150,000 cases of these so-called non-melanoma skin cancers are diagnosed each year in the United Kingdom, plus about 15,000 cases of melanoma cancers which originate from a different cell type in our skin called melanocytes. And unfortunately, the rate by which these cancers are detected um, have increased by approximately 165% since the 1990s, and they are continuing to increase. And this is because we all simply like to have a good time out in the sun. Now, the good news is that most of the non-melanoma skin cancers can be surgically removed and they don't cause any problems, but some can become very aggressive and they can unfortunately cause death. So the problem with sun exposure is that sunlight contains two components called UVA and UVB radiation which carry so much energy that they can damage the material that carries our genetic code, the DNA. Now, as you might know, like a recipe book, DNA holds the instructions for how to build the cells in our body. 
And so if this code is changed significantly, then a healthy normal cell can become a cancer cell. The good news is that a single sun bath doesn't convert our epidermis stem cells straight away into cancer cells, but it is the cumulative sun exposure over the course of our lives that eventually can change the genetic code of our epidermis stem cells to such an extent that they become cancer cells. And what happens then is shown here. So as a consequence of the changes in their genetic code, the stem cells begin to divide more often and in an uncontrolled fashion. And over time, this increased uncontrolled production of cells results then in the formation of a tumor. So here you can see um, a so-called cutaneous squamous cell carcinoma. This is the type of tumor that we are studying in my research group. This is a tumor that originates from stem cells in the epidermis. And you can see here on the right hand side, the still relatively normal epidermis of the unaffected skin. But here on the left side, you can see the mass of the tumor tissue that has been produced by the increased and uncontrolled production of epidermis cells by the stem cells. So thank you very much for tuning in today. And I hope that you found this little presentation about epidermis stem cells and skin cancer entertaining and informative. I would just like to thank the various funding bodies who have been and are sponsoring our skin and skin cancer research. And I would also like to uh, acknowledge my PhD student Alex for the beautiful artwork he has been put together for this presentation. And please, if you want to know more about skin cancer and what you can do to protect your skin and yourselves, go to the website of the British Skin Foundation. There is lots of excellent information there for you. So again, thanks very much for tuning in and I hope you're enjoying the show. Thank you so much, Gernot, for that wonderful talk. You made something very complicated sound quite easy to understand. Um, so yeah, thank you very much for that. Um, everyone else, we now have a very fun quiz. Um, it's the somebody that I used to know quiz. So it's not for the music fans. Um, it's about facts about the body, which you probably did know once, um, but have maybe forgotten. It's just a bit of fun whilst we recover from that amazing talk and before we have our second one, um, so please do join in as we go through. Um, our team will be picking up on your comments. Um, so let us know what you think the answers are um, and just keep a note of what you've done and we'll give you the answers at the end. And then later on, you can let us know how you got on. So let's jump in to the first questions. So how many pints of blood are there in the body? And if you know the difference for females and males, that's great. Um, yeah, how many pints of blood are there in the body? Make sure you leave your answers in the comments. Um, what's the largest organ in the body? Uh, as a clue, it's a fairly topical uh, answer. But the second question is, what's the second largest organ in the body? Um, OK, so then our third question. Why didn't the skeleton go to the party? It's a classic. Um, I'm sure everybody knows that one, but you know, if you're struggling for points. Um, and our next question, can you lick your elbow? Um, let us know in the comments how you got on with that one. Okay, quick fire, true or false? Like your fingerprints, your tongue print is unique. Is that true or false? True or false? Like your fingerprints, your tongue print is unique. True or false? The human body is about 24% water. So is the human body 24% water? True or false? The most complex organ in the human body is the knee. Is that true or false? What's the most complex organ in the body? Is it the knee? Um, and then Second to last, true or false? Inside the womb, unborn baby's lungs are full of water. Is that true or false? 
And finally, for true or false, um, the eyes are always the same size from birth to death. Your eyes always stay the same size. Okay, and then we've got higher or lower round. Um, so the, the answers are mostly they're, they're a form of higher or lower. So we've got, is the number of species of bacteria living in the average human belly button higher or lower than 500? There are more than 500 species of bacteria in the average human belly button. Um, next question, is the volume of saliva produced every day in your mouth more or less than a pint of beer? So is the volume of saliva that you produce every day in your mouth more or less than a pint of beer? Um, hair grows at a rate of around six inches per year. Does bone marrow grow faster or slower than hair? Does bone marrow grow faster or slower than hair which grows at six inches a year? Um, is the smallest bone in the body in the ear or the foot? Um, hopefully you've had time to do that one. And if you go into space to get shorter or taller, shorter or taller if you go into space. Okay. Hopefully you've got some answers. This is this is a blank slide. It's not a mistake. It's a blank slide so that you can scrabble together your answers. Um, and I will give you your answers now and you can mark off how you got on. So pints of blood in the body, 10 on average, but 9 to 10 in females and 10 to 11 in males. The largest organ in the body is the skin of course because that's our topic today but the second largest organ you may or may not know is the liver and the gallbladder considered as one together and of course the classic skeleton didn't go to the party because it had no body to go with and i hope you're all groaning as much as all my production team are right now um so the true or false answers the true ones are in green the false ones are in red so Yes, your fingerprints um, and, to, and your tongue print are both unique. Um, slightly less hygienic to go using your tongue though. Um, the human body is not about 24% water, it's about 60% water. Um, and it's a sen an essential component of every cell in your body. Um, the most complex organ in the human body is the brain, of course, um, not, not the knee. Um, and yes, inside the womb, unborn babies' lungs are full of water. Um, they don't start breathing until after they're born, and so they don't need air in their lungs until then. And false, baby eyes are proportionally larger than adult eyes, but they're still smaller. So at birth, our eyes are about 75% of the size they will have become when we are adults. Okay, so let's know how you got on with them. And then the higher or lower round, your answers are the number of species of bacteria in the average human belly button is lower than 500, is about 67, according to some studies. 67 species in the human belly button. Um, the volume of saliva produced every day in your mouth is about a litre. So that's more than a pint, a litre of saliva. Um, isn't the body great? Hair grows at a rate of six inches a year and bone marrow grows faster. So it's the fastest growing part of the body. Um, the smallest bone in the body is in the ear. It's the steerable stapes and it's about 2.8 millimetres big. Um, and if you go into space, you will get taller because the cartilage discs in your spine will expand due to the lack of gravity. So hopefully you enjoyed that little quiz. It gave you a little bit of a breather um, and time to maybe top up on your drinks if you um, wanted to. So we will now go to our second speaker who is Shirari Pazand and she'll be talking to us about homemade sun cream.
Um, so, Sharari, please give us your talk. Thank you very much. Uh, good evening, everybody. Uh, it is a great pleasure to contribute to Pint of Science UK and to be able to talk about my favorite topic, which is sunscreens. And also, I hope to convince you that it is not safe to make your own at home. So yesterday, when I was preparing this talk, um, I look at the weather on my mobile, and I realized that it's going to rain for the next eight days in Bath. Uh, this is not a big deal for us, because we are all used to the, the rain, and we go to our shopping, we go to our outdoor activities in countryside. But somewhere secretly, we always long about the sunny days. And when the sunny days comes, uh, such as the one here at the Bath University, you see everybody, they rush to the sun, they lie under the sun for a considerable amount of time, and often without protection. And in fact, uh, it is quite strange for you to know that one in four person in Britain never put a sunscreen whatsoever. And then we have also our young population uh, between age of 18 to 25, that they cannot only take these random sunny days uh, in UK, but they prefer also to go to indoor tanning beds which are classified as the most dangerous cancer-causing agents. And they lie under this artificial lamps of UVA uh, for a long time and without any sun cream because they want to get tanned because they associate tanning with the attractiveness. And they admit that they don't want sun creams because sun creams, they are greasy, uh, the, the high protective ones, they are even, you know, have some white residues or they are sticky and as such, they would not like to have them. And then we also long, and it is very popular for us to go to this packaged sunny holidays where we expose the, our unprepared skin for a whole seven or eight days to the sun for a long hours during the day. And again, astonishingly, some people, they don't even put any sun cream or sun lotion under the sun. So talking about the sun, uh, we have to also think of the skin types of individuals. In UK, the majority of fair skin Caucasian population have the skin type of one and two, which are highly susceptible to sunburn. And in fact, they never tan or very poorly tan, but always burn under the sun. And as such, uh, as we heard in the previous talk, the cumulative damage of sunburn and accumulated damage to the skin cells make this kind of people more susceptible to development of skin cancer. So if, if your skin type has type one and two, you should definitely uh, use uh, sun cream for your protection. Now, coming to the sun that we enjoy so much, uh, it has lots of irradiance. And here I'm just talking about ultraviolet uh, part of the sunlight, which is basically 5% of the irradiance incident of the sun. But uh, Per se, it is also composed the ultraviolet to UVC, UVB, and UVA. Most of the UVB and all of the UVC, which are very dangerous part of the sunlight, are fortunately uh, filtered out by the ozone layer uh, in the stratosphere. So only 5% of UVB actually reaches the Earth, Earth's surface. And the majority of the sunlight ultraviolet uh, is actually composed of UVA, which is 95%. And both UVB and UVA are dangerous. UVB can directly hit the DNA, which is the genetic material, as you heard in the previous talk. And UVA also indirectly can hit the cellular component because it can generate harmful free radicals that 
then in turn can, can attack the fat, the protein, and also the DNA. So because of the dangerous nature of sunlight and UVA and UVB, one has to use sun creams to protect their skin, especially in the fair skin population. So if you look at a sun cream or a sun lotion, inside you will find two kinds of components. Either there are some blockers, which are also called physical sunscreen. These are those uh, that uh, scatter or reflect the sun rays, and therefore they block them from getting into the skin. Uh, I'm sure you, some of you have heard about titanium oxide or zinc oxide. These are the sun blockers and very effective one and uh, quite safe also uh, so far. And also you have these chemical sunscreens or organic ones. Uh, these uh, filter some of the UVA tops, but let the other ones in, uh, which are then absorbed uh, inside by the UV rays and by virtue of some chemical reaction, they can change the UV rays into the heat and release the heat into the skin. So in a way they will convert the harmful UV radiation into the heat which will escape from the skin. And an example of such a compound is our benzo. So once you look at the sun, sun cream or sun lotion, you will find some of these ingredients in the uh, composition. Some of these active ingredients, they, they only filter UVB, such as octinoxate, or, 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 and some will only filter UVA component of sunlight, such as our benzone. And then you have components such as zinc oxide, which are broad spectrum. So they have a good filtering effect for UVB, but mostly for UVA. And titanium oxide, which has more uh, uh, spectrum for the UVB, but also some for UVA. So the combination of some of these ingredients in a formulation of the sun lotion or sun cream will allow you to get appropriate protection against sunlight. And um, these are opposed to the ones which are nowadays are advertised to make at home. So in fact, uh, I'm sure you have seen that many websites, they feature some recipes that you can make home, homemade natural sunscreens. In fact, um, there is this perception that everything which is natural is safe, which is untrue. And um, the, the fact that these people, they want to make their home, uh, homemade natural sunscreens is because they are scared of the chemicals in the commercial sunscreens. And uh, this is also because of some of the uh, news and media related to the harm that some of these components can cause to the environment or the sea life. If you look at the ingredients which are used in some of the recipes, uh, in fact, they can be easily found like shishi or cocoa butter, coconut, almond, uh, avocado, lavender, and vitamin E oils. Some of these, they are actually also exist in the sun cream and sun lotion that you can find on the shops. However, these recipes, they claim to have a sun protection factor of to four to six. That uh, obviously, if, if it's, even if it is true, is not enough to protect you against the UV rays. Some other recipes, they say our recipes, they have a very high sun protection factor, a SPF going to 35 to 40 because we add carrot seed essential oils. But when you have a close look at the amount that they are used in these recipes, it is uh, absolutely unlikely that uh, such a, an amount can give such an SPF. And then these recipes, they also contain zinc oxide. That's a good one. I agree, you can add zinc oxide. We say this is a broad spectrum one. But these recipes, they say we have to use it as uncoated and non-nano, so therefore not micronized, and, and as such, because the particle size and proportion, they are actually important for them to act as a sun blocker and scatter the UV rays. Therefore, this kind of proportion, they would need proper careful testing and study. 
So the main problem of the homemade sunscreens for me is that they are unsafe because there is no proper testing and regulation on them. The preparation are not uh, under done under sterile conditions. And also it is not clear how they are formulated because the formulation of these ingredients is by itself in the science because you have to make sure that stay enough on the skin to act as a sunblocker. And some of them, they have enough permeability to get inside of the skin to act as a sunscreen. So there is a whole science behind it. And I'm not so sure if this homemade sunscreens will have them. So if I was you, I will, uh, I will recommend to go and buy the shop bought sun creams because they have uh, all approved UV filtering compounds. They also contain lots of natural antioxidants, which are, you know, against the free radicals of the skin caused by UV rays. They have been extensively tested and regulated and scrutinized by FDA, the European Commission, and the regulatory bodies also in the UK. And the recommendation is that you over, you always use the broad spectrum UVA, UVB sunscreens, which have sun, uh, high sun protection factor, minimum 15, 15 to 29, but also they should have a high UVA protection index. And also it's required that you also use the proper application per body zone, depending on the SPF, according to recommendation, for example, here. I hope that I have convinced you to not use the homemade sunscreens and stick for now for the shop bought some creams one. Thank you very much. That was great. Thank you so much, Shirari, for a wonderful talk. Um, and now we are all very aware of making sure we get our proper uh, sunscreens rather than trying to make them ourselves. Um, we're gonna have a little question and answer session now. Um, so if you haven't already popped your questions in the comments, and please do, um, and hopefully my wonderful production team will be um, putting some questions up for us to put to the speakers. Um, so first question from Victoria Bennett. Is it possible to get a skin cancer in an area of skin that has never been exposed to the sun? Um, Gunnar, I imagine you probably want to go there. So I'll, I'll take this. So yeah, thank you very much for, for the great question, Victoria. It is indeed possible to get skin cancer in areas that have never been exposed to sun, but the chances of getting them are much, much lower. So usually when, when people do get skin cancers in, in non-sun exposed areas, that has something to do with genetics. Yeah? So there are, there are rare genetic conditions where um, people just inherit from their parents um, genetic defects, mutations in their DNA that just makes it easier for cells to grow into cancer cells. And in such cases, it can happen that you do get your, your skin cancer in a non-sun exposed area. So it can happen, but maybe is less likely. You're less it is very much than, less than likely. If, than if you, yes. yeah. Of course, if you have such a genetic condition, yeah, then the likelihood of, of getting a skin cancer is very high. Mm -hmm. So there's, mm -hmm. for example, one skin condition called Xeroderma pigmentosum, uh, where patients are strongly advised not to go into the sun at all. Wow. Yeah, because the risk of, of developing skin cancers is increased so much over the, the normal population. Mm. Okay, um, I don't know if we've got another question. We do. Uh, how does zinc oxide in mineral sunscreens differ to homemade ones? Um, Shirari, I don't know if you've got an answer for that. Okay, thank you very much. Well, the ones which are made at home, uh, they are not micronized. Uh, they need a particular particle size to be effective to scattering the light. So if they are very big or very, uh, they cannot scatter the light. And if they are very small, they can also pass through the skin and they, they, they should stay on the top of their skin. And their role should be that because of their small size, they should scatter the light. So. That is why I wouldn't use the homemade one. <laughs> Made that very clear, yeah. Cool. Um, I think 
uh, whilst we're waiting for the next question to come through, um, when we had a little quiz before, I think, Adam, you probably scored the highest. Um, so well done. You can be very smug about that. Go and tell everybody. Um, but yeah, everyone did really well with that and had some some good guesses, some good informed responses. But um, yeah, well done if you if you got some answers right there. Um, I think another question just popped up, but it maybe disappeared. Yeah, there it is. What sort of tests do you have to do before a sun cream can be put in shops? So rather than it being a homemade one, what what tests do they do to make sure that it's it's okay? Well, the, some of the sunscreen ingredients, first of all, they can be irritant. So this is some of the tests which are done. And actually, it's not only one test. There are a series of sequential tests to see, you know, whether they really block the UVA and UVB rays, whether they, they are not toxic to, to the individuals, and also they will not cause any uh, toxicity or irritants. And after that, once these are done, then again, the regulations uh, and the EU Commission, FDA, they will come with all sorts of tests is that to make sure that it is validated for the everyday use of the population. And would that be, so they do tests on, on animals, on people? Is it, is it like clinical trials like with drugs or is it, is it a bit different to that? Well, in uh, some countries, um, uh, you can use animal studies. In Europe and UK, we cannot use sunscreens for the, on, on animals because they are banned. So therefore, most of the tests, they are done, you know, in skin equivalents. And some of them also done at the later stage on human volunteers. Yeah, cool. That's great. Okay, question from Ben. For the hypochondriacs amongst us, how can we tell the difference between a spot and skin cancer? Gernot, I don't know if you want well, to that one. Well, Ben, for, for the simple answer is very often we can't, yeah? Um, because for the untrained, for the non-professional, it is very difficult to, to see the difference between an early stage of a skin cancer and the spot. So I would strongly recommend everybody always go to your gp if you are in doubt uh, and and get yourself referred to a to a dermatologist because they they have the tools and the devices and the experience to to really tell a normal spot from an early stage skin skin cancer apart cool that's great advice um how can we tell if a product we buy has actually been regulated or approved by the appropriate bodies? Is there some kind of like certification or like, you know, big tick that says, yes, this one's good? Well, uh, in, in Europe and in UK, if you don't have this regulation approval, you cannot sell them. And if you sell some things which has not been approved, you can go to prison. So that's for sure. But it, in addition to that, you need to look at, at some verifications on the, on, the, on the tubes of, you know, sun creams and sun lotion itself, where there is proper UVB and UVA protection index, you know, specified, because some of them, they might look attractive, but once you look at, you know, what actually they protect, maybe they are not good. But most of the time, such a products, uh, they will not be available uh, for approval in the shops. That's good to, good to know. Um, and would there be any, maybe like, is there a particular ingredient that you would say keep an eye out in case it's in it and it's really good and useful or in case it's in it, but actually it doesn't tend to be so useful? I think you mentioned some in your talk. Well, uh, all the ingredients, they have been added for some reasons, but if any doubt, at least you have to make sure that there is titanium oxide or zinc oxide there because these are the first uh, uh, sun blocking agents that will, you know, block the, you know, the sun getting at, actually into your skin. But this is the, the first passive, you know, protection. And when you have the active protection inside of your skin, you use antioxidants so that, you know, it can neutralize the free radicals made by UVA and also some of the UVB components. And also the fact that you will have also other stronger sunscreens which can actually neutralize the UV radiation which passes through the skin because the 
some blockers they have failed and they you know just dissipate them as a heat so all of them are somehow necessary yeah that's great thank you um i think we've got another question if some beds are so dangerous should they not be banned Ooh. A good discussion question. I feel like you can maybe maybe I think both Shirara, yeah. I think Sharar and I will agree that they should be <laughs> absolutely. Yeah. And there are many countries in the world that have already banned them. Uh, Australia is, is is one example. Yeah, where the use of of uh, tanning beds is is completely forbidden. Um, and I think here in the UK, it depends on on which of the four nations you are actually living in. Well, it is usually Gerna is right. Um, from 2009, it is known that some beds are carcinogen. So from 2011, they got you know banned uh, in several countries, and a uh, few years later, they're also banned in UK only for any population below the age of 18. But unfortunately, we still have, you know, there's some uh, beds available everywhere. And I agree with Gerno that one day or another, they have to really ban it because this, uh, I have seen, um, you know, young people going there. And just to what I had in one of my slides, you know, statistics have shown that if you have gone to this, some tanning beds before the age of 35, you have a 90% chance of getting a skin cancer. Mm. So, sorry, and I should, I should probably add on to this, and, and, and this also brings us a little bit to, to Ty Gordon's question, is skin cancer due to cumulative exposure? Of course it is. Yeah? So it, it really matters how many episodes of really high dose UVB exposures did you have in your life. Yeah? And and if as a kid or as a, as a uh, as an adolescent you you used to go out into the sun a lot if you had several episodes of severe sunburns those are all really important risk factors that strongly increase the risk for developing a skin cancer at a very late age because we mustn't forget um, the type of cancers we're talking here they are cancers that usually appear in the older population. Uh, mm -hmm. So it is really important to 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 prevent damage to our skin at an early age. Yeah? So so my appeal is he, is here to to the parents in particular. Yeah? Really make sure that that you put a good amount of sunscreen on on your kids when when they play in the sun. Yeah? Because uh, several episodes of severe sunburns. This is you know when when you you develop blisters and and the skin uh, might might start to peel off. Um, those those can be really dangerous risk factors for developing a skin cancer later. Yeah, so I guess I guess yeah, put put the sun cream on when you're a kid and keep wearing it as you as you get older. If it's all about uh, cumulative exposure. Um, I think. Can you oh, okay? Can you miss the signs of skin cancer in deeper skin tones? Does this happen? Now that that is a very good question. So that there is a correlation um, between skin pigmentation and the risk of developing skin cancer. So darker skin tones tend to be more protected, and having fair skin, sprinkles, red hair, those are certainly risk factors for for developing um, skin cancers at at a later age. Um, can you miss the signs of of skin cancer? Yes, of, of, of course, that, that's what I um, mentioned earlier. You can, especially the early stages, they can, they can be easily missed. Yeah? And I should probably also reiterate here that there are two broadly different categories of skin cancers. So we have the melanoma skin cancers, which are the skin cancers that most people will be aware of, yeah? which are the, the, the cancers that develop from a cell type called a melanocyte and these are the pigmented cells in our body that also um, provide our body with with color that um, underlie the process of tanning yeah? and and these are the cells that are aggregated in the moles we might have on our bodies yeah? so this is melanoma and melanoma isn't that frequent but it tends to be very very dangerous yeah? because Melanoma cells have the ability to metastasize. This is when they uh, leave the tumor and, and can move through the body to, to distant 
um, other body sites. And then we have the non-melanoma skin cancers, which are the cancers I've been talking about, which originate from stem cells in our epidermis. And they can be really hard to spot yeah, because it, it, they might develop just as a tiny area with, with some scales, yeah, really hard to notice. But, uh, and that's why, again, it is important, if in doubt, to really see um, a specialist. Can I also add to all this fantastic explanation of Gerno that uh, in the dark population, um, the pigments melanin um, has two kinds. There is a good melanin and the bad melanin. In the people who have a darker uh, skin, the good melanin proportion is much, much higher. And therefore, they get you know, this natural protection against the sunlight. In the white population, when they get tanned, uh, they, they accumulate the bad melanin, which by itself is photosensitizer because it can actually, upon the sunlight exposure, make some free radical formation. So therefore, um, in a lot of debates, uh, tanning of the white skin population is equal to damage and is actually sun tanning is already a very big sign of damage in the young people. Mm. Yeah, it's an important distinction, I think, um, to sort of realise that. Um, I think we've got time for maybe one or two more questions. So we've got from Adam, our quiz hero. Um, we need the bad UVB sunlight for vitamin D production. How much is required and is it a dangerous balancing act? And this maybe links back to what we're talking about with the sunbeds, sorts of the arguments for sunbeds or, or well, we're in the UK and it's never sunny enough. Um, is that really true? Well, Do you want to take that, Gerard? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Vitamin D is a $64,000 question, really. Um, <laughs> I would say uh, what I say always that if you are scared of vitamin D production and you will be, I would rather put some creams and put some supplements because, you know, uh, especially if you have a fair skin and you are sensitive to sunlight, I will not play the fact that getting vitamin D is better than, you know, getting some damage and, and some burn. But um, it, it is clearly known that in the darker population they are more prone to vitamin d deficiency because they would get less uvb anyway and some of the links which has recently been done between covid 19 and white vitamin d in this cohort is related to that but in the um, in the white skin population it is true that you know 20 minutes in sunlight with UVB can help to pr produce the vitamin D, but nowadays with the supplements and the, and all sorts of you know um, um, healthy diets that we can have, we can get lots of vitamin D. So I wouldn't worry about it. So you'd say put your sun cream on if you're going outside in the sunshine um, and make use of lots of the supplements, and you should be able to balance that. Absolutely. quite well i do i don't know if you had any more to add on that gun or if you were happy with that with that i'm i'm happy with that i would just say for the for the average population in the uk we're all relatively fair skinned here um we should be able to um, produce enough vitamin d within 10 to 15 minutes when we go out in in the sun uh, around midday and 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 if we do this with putting a little bit sunscreen on I, I i would generally feel okay about that perfect ideal so there you go you've got got your answer for how long um karen says i have psoriasis which gets significantly better in the sun can you explain why i can maybe start Sharara, and, and and then you can take over so it does bring us a little bit back to the question before and and one of the keys is vitamin d because that also serves as an anti-inflammatory agent so when when the skin produces enough vitamin d that can also help to combat 
inflammation which which is at at the source of of psoriasis yes uh absolutely right um i know a lot of people with psoriasis that they like to go to the sun because you know the the lesions they disappear but i'm sure you will tell me karen that when the fall comes uh, you get the lesions back much much stronger so I don't think it's a good idea to go to the sun to, to decrease the lesions because you are also adding other uh, defects to your skin damage. So psoriasis, you know, they can be cured by other means than sunlight. I don't recommend to go to the sun. Really. So uh, that's wonderful answers from both of you. Um, I think we're going to have to um, wrap up because we're running out of time. But this has been a really great discussion, especially the question and answer session. It's been really interesting. Um, I didn't know I had so many questions about skin, but there we go. Um, so thank you both for your wonderful talks and for answering all of our questions. Um, thank you to everybody who's tuned in and uh, took part in our quiz. And um, yeah, if you enjoyed it, we've got lots of events on um, or weekly pint of science. So if you look at, just um, look on the website and the other YouTube links. Um, and yeah, keep an eye out for next year, of course, um, back in Bath with the Our Body theme or maybe with a different theme. Um, and yeah, go and check out the other talks that are on this evening. Um, and otherwise, enjoy the rest of your Tuesday. Thank you very much. <laughs>